The music industry is a lie. Waka Flocka recognized this early on, and after the day he got shot, he came up with a plan to escape and change his life for the better. Waka is one of the rare examples of an artist who was able to see the highest of the highs in the music industry, and it didn't come crashing down in an all-out downward spiral. But make no mistake, his life wasn't easy. In the year 2000, his 10-year-old brother died because of a tiny, tiny decision that Waka made. Ralik Malfers was the younger brother of Waka, whose real name is Wakin. Their mother, Deborah Antney, forbade them from leaving the house after school until she got home from work. But one dark day in Riverdale, Georgia, Ralik promised a friend he would help him with some homework. Waka encouraged Ralik to sneak out and said he would cover for him if their mother came home. Ralik left and was hit by a drunk driver. It was their neighbor, who ran over Ralik's head. To make matters worse, the neighbor was found not guilty of his crimes. Losing his brother in this manner had a detrimental effect on him. For the next 10 years of his life, Waka wasn't even sure who he really was. I don't know who I was from 8th grade to being, I'm talking about from 14 to 26, I don't Luckily for Waka, he had an amazing mother, who not only worked numerous jobs to support him and his brothers, but would soon network with the right people and change the trajectory of both of their lives forever. Deborah landed a position with the Georgia Department of Family and Children's Services. It was here where she began to mingle with local artists, such as Ludacris, who would come visit the kids at the shelter as a way to give back to the community. I started working at Fulton County and my whole life was just different. And then here, I meet Ludacris. Wow. I met Ludacris, but at that time, Ludacris was not Ludacris. He was Chris Lover Lover. Lover. Yeah, yeah, so it was yeah, Chris yeah. Lover Lover and Poon Daddy. Okay. <laughs> and they used to bring all the artists that are here to the shelter for the children. Before any artist got big, they would bring him there to station. But Deborah was no stranger to the music industry. Her brother, Bimmy Atney, was an A&R at Def Jam, close friends with LL Cool J, and worked on projects with Mariah Carey and 50 Cent, a true OG in the New York hip-hop scene, a scene Waka's mom never planned on being involved in. In 2005, Deborah received a call asking if she could help a local rapper getting out of jail to get set up with some community service. The rapper they were referring to was Gucci Mane. Breaking onto the scene in 2005 with his single, Icy, Gucci was a bubbling artist in Atlanta, but at the time he was far from a mainstream success. After connecting with Gucci for his required community service, Deborah saw the musical potential and decided to help out his career. She had the knowledge, the family connections, and most importantly, a spare room for Gucci to crash in rent-free. Not long after moving in with Waka and his brothers, Waka and Gucci would become very close. Their friendship would grow even stronger over the next year, with Gucci officially signing to Deborah's newly established management company, Mize Entertainment, in 2007, a company that would help launch the careers of artists like French Montana and Nicki Minaj just years later. Waka looked at Gucci as a brother, and he wanted to help out with Gucci's rap career any way he could. So I started from right there, I said, you know what I'm gonna be? I'm, I'm gonna be your assistant, bro. Right. I'm gonna be your security. Well, I never knew these titles, but this is what I was doing. I, hey, bro, you can't even pick a bag up, you're a star. Unfortunately, Gucci couldn't help getting in trouble with the law and was constantly in and out of prison, completely stunting the growth of his rap career and leaving Waka uncertain about his future. Not wanting his family to fail, Waka decided to take matters into his own hands and get in the studio. Even though Gucci Mane straight up told him to his face he shouldn't be a rapper and that he was better off as a goon, Waka didn't care. He had a mission to make it big. I'm also on a mission to tell you about today's sponsor, Casetify. Casetify is the world's most popular tech accessory brand, known for their protective phone cases and numerous collaborations. Casetify's EcoShock technology, which is embedded in the Impact Series cases, provides a 20% increased protection while also maintaining a slim and sleek design. The Impact Series cases are great for everyday protection, providing up to 11 and a half feet of drop height, in which we are going to put to the test right now. Phone's working. Hard ground. Nothing. Not a scratch, not a dent. 
Caseify partners with artists to bring you so many cool designs to choose from. Nathan Bennett is one of my favorites. All of his designs are clean and give off positivity. If those aren't your style, then there's so many more to choose from. Go to casetify.com slash patrickcc to get 15% off your order. Thanks, Casetify. On January 14th, 2009, Walker released his debut mixtape titled Salute Me or Shoot Me. 23 songs of aggressive, in-your-face trap music featuring the likes of Soldier Boy, his older brother Huda Kid, and a verse from Gucci himself. Managed by his mother, he would also join Gucci's first independent label called So Icy Entertainment. Releasing numerous mixtapes in 2009, his buzz was growing quickly, but his true breakthrough would come the following year with his debut studio album, Flockavelli. This album had hit songs like Oh Let's Do It, which peaked at number 62 on the Billboard Hot 100, and No Hands featuring Wale, which peaked at number 13. An absolute smash success for a rapper who was only in the game for just over a year. Flockavelli is an album that many people point to for inspiring a large part of the mainstream trap sound, but before Waka could really enjoy this newfound fame and money, he was hit with a reality check like none other. Rapper Waka Flocka Flame shot, robbed. On the afternoon of January 19th, 2010, the 23-year-old rapper was shot and robbed at a bubble bath car wash in Atlanta. Similar to many of the tragic killings we've seen in the rap game, the robber targeted Waka for his jewelry. Fortunately for Waka though, he made it out of this robbery alive. With only one gunshot wound to the arm, that day would end up being a major turning point for him, sparking him to reflect and question this so-called glamorous rapper lifestyle. Like, I felt like that was less than God. You know what I mean? Because at the time, I was just like the most evilest person on the planet. Like, my mind was just devious, you know what I'm saying? I was just promoting all the craziest in life. And I felt like God had to stop me because I had a whole year and a half of my life just in fast forward. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. So at that point in my life, I was slowed down. I, I realized who, who I am, what I was, and what I'm doing. And when I got shot, my leave ain't called me. He ain't called me and said, yo, you okay? You know what I'm saying? That was Warner Brother. Guess what this man said? Yo, can you record? I'm like, what? So, man, they fought after I got shot. I never in my life trust like this. Because you owe you, you money to them. You ain't no artist. You you, you owe you go to the ticket. Until your ticket rub off and the color go away, they gonna stick around as soon as your ass to them even feel like they can't make no money. They ain't, they ain't worried about you. After recovering, gaining a new outlook on life, and having tons of success with his debut studio album, everything appeared to be going great for Waka. But behind the scenes, cracks were starting to form. A cautionary tale of why you should never mix business with family. In May of 2010, Gucci Mane announced from jail that he was leaving his label So Icy Entertainment and cutting ties with Mize Entertainment, no longer to be managed by Waka's mom. Allegedly, Mize was booking Gucci for shows across the country without disclosing that he was headed to jail, and also illegally selling Gucci Mane verses, which resulted in several federal lawsuits, which led Gucci to saying the following, I'm taking control of all my business properties and keeping the focus on my career, my music, and my artists. All the pieces to the puzzle are finally in place, and once I get home, it's Gucci time. Gucci Mane would then become the president and CEO of Brick Squad 1017 Records, an imprint of Warner Records the label that Waka Flocka would sign to as well, making him one of the first artists on Brick Squad. Although Waka was still managed by his mother, this whole situation would kickstart the eventual demise of their friendship. After riding the momentum of Flaccavelli into 2011 and releasing a collaborative mixtape with Gucci Mane called Ferrari Boys on August 9th of that year, Waka would start his own label under 1017 Records called Brick Squad Monopoly. He was on top of the world. He had another single in rotation, round of applause featuring Drake, and Waka was a mainstream star. But just as he was reaching his peak success, he was hit with another tragedy. Waka's best friend and fellow 1017 rapper Slim Duncan was shot and killed. On December 16th, 2011, Slim was at Star Studios in Atlanta. The whole 1017 family was there because Gucci Mane had a video shoot scheduled. At some point, Slim got into a verbal altercation with Young Vito, another ATL rapper, which ended in Vito taking a shot at Slim's stomach. He was rushed to the hospital and later died. Waka tweeted, Wish it was me. My right hand is gone. Waka was devastated. First he was shot, now his best friend was taken out. He blamed himself for the incident. How did um, how did, how did you know Slim Duncan's death affect you? I mean, I'm sure it's still affecting you now, but I don't, I don't, I don't accept it. I don't accept it. Period. Like as far period. as like you don't feel like he's gone. Yep, I don't. I don't accept it. Keep his number in your phone and don't accept it. You can't right. accept it. Do you do you feel like justice has been served being that you know the the guy that did it? I hope I hope he win. Hope he free. 
Hope he get free. Mm. Straight up. He better hope he doesn't. I saw you put on Twitter. You wish it was you, like. Hey, that's my that's my dog. Like I made him rap. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. like, if I would never made him rap, man, I'll imagine. You know what I mean? That's how you feel. Like, yeah. So you feel like if, if you hadn't made him rap, he'd still be here. Yeah. Wow, that's heavy, man. That's heavy to wear. You can hear the pain in Waka's voice. He needed to restart his whole career, his whole life. At least he still had his brother Gucci Mane, and that was enough for him to still want to pursue a rap career. But as Waka continued to get more and more popular and began taking some of the spotlight away from Gucci, tensions would rise and egos would clash, culminating in a public beef that would rip the two apart. Waka Flocka Flames officially dropped off Brick Squad 1017. Big Guwop says, give me an offer for this disloyal dude. This tweet from March 15th, 2013 would send shockwaves across the entire hip hop scene. A rep for Gucci claimed that the tweet was the job of a hacker, but Waka didn't buy it. Sparking Waka to respond with, I'm the loyalest person you could ever see. I took on a man's beef, risked my life, hung out the window, risked my freedom. I never backed in a corner. To my knowledge, it ain't nothing but jealousy. Also in that same month, Waka would diss Gucci at a Dipset reunion show. Things got even more heated between the two when Gucci sued Waka Flocka and his mom in November of that year, stating that Deborah stole jewelry from him, failed to report tax information on her income, misappropriated his assets, withheld royalty payments, and inflated costs and record label expenses. Waka would clap back on Twitter, but also made an appearance on The Breakfast Club to air out how he was feeling about the fallout. I want to eat though, you know what I mean? I don't want to be out here looking like a bum. I don't care how crazy he's doing, or I don't care if he jump off the roof. I don't care. If I catch him, it's going digital. I don't want to kill him or nothing. I just want, I just want to slap him a couple of times. It's like a little brother. The duo once referred to as the Batman and Robin of the Atlanta rap scene was now completely dismantled. Plus, it didn't help that fans were taking Gucci's side, since they all thought the only reason Waka was popular was because of Gucci's fame. And just when things couldn't seem to get any worse, Waka was struck with another family tragedy. Rapper Waka Flocka Flame's younger brother, K.O. Red, dies from apparent self-delete. On December 29th, 2013, Waka would lose another younger brother. K.O. was an artist, just like Waka, trying to make a name for himself in the rap game. The two of them had music together, performed together, and were extremely close. There was a lot of pressure being the younger brother of Waka Flocka Flame, and sadly K.O. was also losing his eyesight. The night K.O. expired, he had attempted to reach out to his big bro, but now falling back into his fast-paced lifestyle, Waka did not answer the call, making him wonder if anything would have been different if he had just stopped for a second and picked up the phone. I seen him call. I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna call K.O. back as soon as this show would. I call him back, no answer. <laughs> He called you before he. I, I, I don't know who else he called, but that's what if I don't pick that call up? Like, that's when I seen like, yo, this rap shit, this rap shit. The loss of KO made Waka turn to getting high to numb the pain, a slippery slope for anyone to fall down. He lost two blood brothers. He lost his best friend that he had considered a brother, and had a falling out with Gucci, who was basically his adopted brother. Waka was losing everyone. Life was passing him by, and he had lost sight of the things that truly matter. He decided he needed to better himself. He finally had enough. Reevaluate his life, focus on being a role model instead of just a rapper. And that's exactly what he did. Waka was well aware at this point in his life how toxic and manipulative the music industry really was. Not only did he let himself get caught up in the lifestyle, he was blatantly lied to from the very start by his label. After signing for only $50,000 in 2010, Warner would constantly cover up how much revenue he was generating. As soon as I signed a deal, it just all hell broke loose. Like the label been lying from day one. Day one. Like when I tell y'all, like I tell them like, all right, yo, did I recoup yet? They're like, nah, you ain't recoup. I'm like, how did I not recoup? I got 400 shows a month. Like, yeah, I mean, mm. every record I got was popping. I'm like, how did I not recoup? It was acts like this that added salt to his wounds and confirmed to Waka that he was right to take his life in a different direction. Being a father figure, learning financial literacy, investing in businesses, and pursuing other passions like sports and video games being his new priority. After getting married to Tammy Rivera in 2014, Waka made a commitment to being a strong father figure in the life of her daughter Charlie, the child that Tammy had when she was just a teenager. Although Charlie isn't his biological daughter, that didn't matter. The two built a special bond 
and Waka has been by her side ever since she was four years old. And basically after 2014, he stopped caring about the music industry. He never dropped another album, he didn't care about any fame, he just wanted to better his life. He also began focusing his time on suicide prevention and mental health awareness. Him and his mom started the No R.I.P. Foundation in honor of his brother, which helps grieving families by promoting responsible media reporting on deaths. Investing his time in mental health awareness also helped him come to terms with the loss of his brother Ko. Tweeting this in 2020, You have no idea how it feels to want to delete your own life, man. My little brother took his own life, man, and I deal with this fact every birthday because his birthday is a day after mine. This year I'm officially accepting the fact that he's in a better place. Because of his efforts, Waka received an honorary doctorate in philanthropy and humanitarianism in New York. Although Waka did extremely well financially thanks to his rap career, he wasn't the smartest with his money early on, which to be fair, not many rappers are. However, with his newfound perspective on life, he started taking financial literacy and business very seriously. It's easy. Once I, and I, once I learned the credit game, it was over. Game was over. When I know I had all the millions and I didn't even have a credit card, the dumbest. I was like the dumbest person ever. I used to just spend money on everything. Man, please. Yeah. Please. I'm, I'm going to open up insurance, put two, three million in my insurance, and borrow from that and put it back in. Get your credit right. Clean your credit up. Mm. For me to y'all, clean your credit up. Stop putting everything in your name, create a business, an LLC, put everything in your LLC. Mm. And, let, and open up a C Corp if you don't know that you need to figure these out. I'm telling you the names. Get a C Corp to run an LLC. If you want to make it even deeper, go get a trust fund and run a corp that runs the LLC. You want to get even deeper, own two um, trust funds for your business and your person to run that trust that runs all the business. It can get deep, my God. He didn't totally stay out of entertainment, though. He was able to land a pretty successful reality show on WeTV called Waka and Tammy, What the Flocka, which definitely had its downsides, but at least he was able to get money while spending time with his family. We probably won't get another Waka Flocka album. And if we're lucky, maybe a single here and there, but that's okay. These days, he spends his time playing old school video games, building his farm, feeding his cows, investing in cryptocurrency, philanthropy, and living life to the fullest. Whenever he does speak or post on social media, it's to try to get you to learn from him and try to better your life. Waka didn't get stuck in the music industry trap. He made millions of dollars from music, but at the expense of losing loved ones. Most people would continue the rat race, drugs, partying, and pursuing a career filled with depression and satisfying others for a dollar. But Waka, he quit and took his life into his own hands. Funny thing is, he's richer now than he was before, and he's happier. So why would he ever go back to music?